We have uh, later on Miss Gloria Loring, uh, Carl Reiner's here, Joanna Cassidy, and this gentleman whom you all know after, what, 13 years, 14 years 14. on Bonanza? <clears throat> uh, fine actor, also an excellent director. On Saturday, March 30th, from 9 to 11 on NBC, we'll present the movie Little House on the Prairie, in which he stars. Would you welcome Michael Landon? Michael! <laughs> Every... Get a little risque, rolled up the sleeves. Oh, yeah, well, you can't. That's a tough act to follow, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody now. I see you all the time on television with the milk. That's right. Oh, yeah, all over the place. Milk and jelly beans. That's right. <laughs> How are you? and mustard. Very good. Yeah. Did you yeah. see that on the opening of our show? Certainly did. I liked how he made it smile. I don't know how he did that. A little tush going off there was beautiful. <laughs> I was actually so stunned, you don't know what to say. You know, what would you say? Huh? Hi. <laughs> Goodbye. When's, when's the movie show I, I just made? March uh, 31st, which is when? This? 30th. The 30th, excuse yeah. me. That would be when? Saturday? Yeah, 9 o'clock. Saturday? You star in this? Did you direct, direct star it? Star in it, uh, directed it, and I produced it. And we got a film clip you're going to show us tonight, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Does it need any setting up, or do we... Oh, no, except that I think most shows uh, start out with a big action sequence, and uh, I thought tonight to... It's really a show about a family, and... The closeness of a father to his daughters and, and yeah. to his wife. And so, just thought we'd show you some soft, uh, touching moments. Kind of nice, dramatic. Uh... Yeah. Fine. I have not seen it, so uh, you have to watch. Can you see the monitors here in the studio? Mm -hmm. We'll run it, mm -hmm. and uh... Mm -hmm. Carolyn, I ran in a trick. <laughs> Yeah, but Sabbath. <laughs> I hurt myself bad. <laughs> okay, we're rolling. It's really dark in this chair, Carolyn. Uh, here with your bird. Mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're burning up. Your hand is like ice. We're all sick, Charles. Take an enema. <laughs> an extra bonus because it's too young to leave its mother. Now there'll be milk for the children. I don't care about the children, but Carol. I'm fed up with the kids. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> oh, my butt. 15 years on Bonanza. It still hurts when I ride. <laughs> Because we, 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 have, we have lighter moments, too, in the show. It's, it's not all serious. Those are what they call... Uh, I hadn't seen those. I didn't want to see them before, because somebody said you were coming up with something special. And uh, those are what they call uh, the outtakes. Yes. The things that, uh, that happen uh, when you're filming and you blow your lines and so forth. Yeah. That's funny. A lot of times you really want to kick yourself, though, for not letting the camera roll longer. Because most of the times the, the operator... I mean, once I s scream, I really hurt myself... Uh, we cut the camera, then after uh, the things that happen, you wish you would have let it roll because it, it just gets funnier and funnier. Those are very funny. Jack Warner has sent me once some, a reel from, uh, I guess, a lot of things they had around the studios for years, and they're absolutely hysterical when they really goof. They had one, I think it was somebody, you remember Charles Sterrett, the Western? He was like in the era of Buck Jones, who missed the horse <laughs> once. He came up and he put his foot in the... And the whole saddle came off of the horse. 
and fell on the ground, and then, of course, they say things that you cannot say on the air. But it, it is absolutely incredible. Did you do that a lot on Bonanza? Well, the Cartwrights have 800 of those in the Library of Congress, in the film library. Uh, the Lorne was classic. Did you try to break each other up or what? Oh, are you kidding? Every time you would see a dining room scene where, where Lorne is sitting there seriously telling the boys that although we're 36 years old, we can't go to town alone yet. <laughs> I, mean, I, I always wondered about that whole relationship in that family. A little, no, no. a little weird. The Cartwrights were all right. Okay. Right. Thank goodness Hop Singh was a little... Uh, but, but what we would do to Lorne, Lorne would be sitting there, and no matter what the food was, we liked peas the best because you could fire them from a long distance. And Dan Blocker and I would sit there with spoons, Pew. bouncing them off Lorne's head in between dialogue. He'd get out of line and pea would hit him. You'd have to wipe that off. That gets expensive, too, doesn't it? I mean, no, if, if you're cheap. I mean, no, I mean... <laughs> one, two, three, four. Boom! I did a very short stint once on Broadway in Tunnel of Love. And uh, after you've done a play, and Ed's done the, the, the thing he did on Broadway, after you've done the same thing, as you well know, for about two months, you get a little bored with the dialogue. So they would start to do things on stage that the audience can't see, which is really <clears throat> unprofessional, because it's not fair to the audience to see actors on stage doing crazy things. But... If the audience was here and you're facing each other, a piece of lint would, you know, be in the light and the other actor would be looking at it like this, <laughs> looking right at you with these terrible cross eyes following this, and you're doing the same. It is absolute murder. What Dan, what Dan used to like to do is if we had a... Because we had a lot of fun on the show, and, and the majority of times we would have uh, actors on the show that were a great bunch of guys to be with, or, or gals as the case may be. But if you got a guy who was really a stiff and really started to irritate you... Dan would just go, and we would start an argument. We would carry the argument over to lunch, and he would invite the actor to lunch, and I would sit in the next booth, and we'd continue the argument, and it would get louder in a very crowded restaurant, and louder, and the, the actor is very nervous, but you don't say no when a 300-pound cowboy asks you to go eat lunch with him. And he would get a little more frightened, a little more frightened. Finally, I would grab the steak knife off the table, lunge at Dan, grab a hold of him, jerk him under the table, screaming at him, lift the knife up, and Dan wore a hairpiece. And I'd just tear it off and hold it up like that. And you'd get some guys that would really... Ah, little pill under the tongue. Thing. It's cardiac city. Mm -hmm. Dan had a great sense of humor because one the first night I think he was on the show. Oh, Remember that? that the, he oh. came on by himself. Well, were you on it at that time? Anyway, no. he came out first. And he was a big fellow, six foot five, 300 pounds, something like that. And he, did a, he came on like he was drunk, which he wasn't. And he walked out, and he started to walk, and he did it. The greatest comedy pratfall you have ever seen, flat on his face. And there's that awful silence for a yeah. moment where people oh don't know if it's for real or not. No, he, he was great at that. He used to terrify directors with that. He'd come back after lunch when we had a new director. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what are we going to shoot it? <laughs> I, want, I want that close-up. Big, big close-up. Lauren Green gets a lot of close-ups. I don't get a lot of close-ups. And the director's going, well, we were, we're not going to do the close-ups yet. Why not? <laughs> well, we're, I'm going to do the master shot. Then the director would end up immediately going to Lauren because he's the father of the world. <clears throat> Lauren, what do we do with him? Uh, Lauren would go right along with it. He said, I wouldn't tell him you don't want to shoot. He said, <laughs> he said, well, uh, he said, he said, well, I'll just pretend we're rolling the cameras. He said, he'll know. He can hear it. <laughs> and he would hang this guy up that's for an funny. hour, just driving bananas. That's, that's he did a thing with a bunch of people on the set one day. We had a whole lunch, a bunch of babies, real babies, as opposed to rubber babies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, you don't think that milk is getting going right. there. Well, you've been no, too so much of that calcium in the brain. Is, uh, no, we got, so we've there. got 15, 15 little babies just screaming and wailing. It was a baby contest on, on one of the episodes. So we must have had 50 visitors on the set. And they all looking at Dan. They love him, you know, the hall of Cartwrights, good guys and all that. And Dan is hugging one of these little babies. love babies. And he puts the baby down. But he had the prop man put a rubber baby down in the basket so they couldn't see it. So he put the baby down, and the baby started to cry right away. And he said, no, 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 now come on, now, don't cry. Uncle Dan's got you there. 
And he started to walk across the stage oh. towards all these poor innocent folk, and he tripped. And... <laughs> oh. oh. Now up goes this baby in a blanket right over their heads, and the woman are going, ah! Oh. <laughs> there oh. goes under the tongue oh, again. Right. Oh. That, that's frightening. That's... We no. never were injured on the show, but we lost a lot of visitors. <laughs> You know, H. Allen Smith did a book once, I think we talked about it, called The Complete Practical Joker, in which he recounted a lot of the things that people used to. They don't do the very involved practical jokes. Uh, and I think the first one was, and you've probably heard of it, is the fellow who walked out of the... He had a bench made, went to Central Park, and it looks exactly like the benches in Central Park. He actually had it made. He smuggled it, like, into the park when nobody was watching. And you now he's sitting on the bench, and he waits until it... Police walk, policeman walks by, and he picks up the bench and walks out of the park with it. And naturally, he gets arrested. And they take him down, and now he produces the slip. He, said, he says to the cop, he says, it's my bench. <laughs> you know, he says, it's my bench. I paid for it. The cop took him in, and now he produces the bill for the bench, and they have to let him off. That's how far they would go just to do something like that. We have to do this? Going to sell something? All righty. We will be back after this short pause. Talking with Mike Lannon, who will star this Saturday night in Little House on the Prairie on NBC. Is that that's from children's? Uh, book? Was it a children's book or from books. a series of books? Uh, the the initial show. It's a it's a pilot for a series. The the initial show is from the book Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. She wrote nine books. And they've sold some 40 million copies. They're really kind of a marvelous set of children's yeah. books. My kids love them. Yeah, less people think that the the whole thing is crazy comedy or something. Oh no, no, no it's the, the show itself, of course, is not all outtakes. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of the regular stuff in there, too. We were talking about practical jokes. What's the thing you started to tell me, and I said, save it and oh, we, share it with the audience? Oh, you were talking about how complicated practical jokes got. Well, we had a particular director on the show, and, uh, and he got into a practical joke situation with Dan. Well, it started out with an ant, and then went to uh, a fly, to a mouse. Now Dan, while the man is working at the studio, has an ostrich delivered to his apartment and put inside. A live ostrich? live ostrich, yes. And when he came home, it had, uh, it had fun with his uh, carpeting and uh, also ate his lampshades and <laughs> just absolutely wiped out the guy's apartment. <clears throat> now, Dan goes to work, and the guy's not going to bother to pull another trick on Dan because Dan is he's ready for it now. Dan's wife was not ready. She's sitting having her coffee one morning, and a limousine pulls up, and a man gets out in a turban with about 15 suitcases. Comes up and uh, he said, I am uh, Turan. I will have to be at your home for only approximately four or five months until Baba is able to physically cope with you and the children. And she said, well, she's such a friendly woman. She was marvelous. Well, fine. Uh, she doesn't know what Baba is. Uh, where is Baba? He will be coming in a moment. The moving van cannot move as quickly as the limousine. It's an elephant. <laughs> Delivered to his house, walks up the front of his brick steps, crushes all the steps. The guy takes the thing into the backyard and puts it in the pool. <laughs> now, Dolph calls the studio to talk to Dan. Dan immediately knows what it is, so he gets with the director, and they both play the joke on Dolph. He says, Bob will be very happy in a pool, and that's why we have a pool, so an elephant can have a bath. <laughs> Just for the practical Just joke? Just for a joke. What was the one? I, I don't think it's apocryphal, but one of the great, I think we talked about on the show once, about the fellow who bought, when the Volkswagens first came out and were popular in this country, the guy had heard about the great mileage. So he buys a Volkswagen, and his friends at night, and the guy would drive, I think he lived in Long Island, would drive into New York to work, maybe 30, 40 miles, and at night his friends would go over and fill the gas tank. Now the guy keeps driving for... <laughs> That's beautiful. He's driving for like two weeks, and the gauge really hasn't even moved at all. <laughs> and, he's, and he thinks this is so great. So what they, they go for about two weeks that way, where the guy hasn't used any gas, and now they go at night, and they start siphoning the gas out. Oh. Now the guy goes to the, goes to the <laughs> Volkswagen dealer and says, I don't know what happened, he says. He says, I was getting the usual 200 miles per gallon the first week. <laughs> Can you imagine that? There are all kinds of wild jokes like that. Somebody used to, uh, <laughs> some, some lady had, a, this, this, most of these from H. Allen Smith's book, The Complete Prime, had a goldfish in a little aquarium. 
And as the friends would visit her, each time they would come in, they would add a fish just a little bit larger. And every day this goldfish, or by week by week. And finally, this fish was about this size, and then it reversed the process. You can absolutely drive people crazy that way. <laughs> that is funny. And then the fish would get smaller. You know, get, you got to go to a lot of work to do those kind of jokes. Oh, yeah. But it's fun. Hey, last time you were here, you were talking, you were kind of putting down your vacation in Hawaii. Did you have any repercussions on that? Well, I didn't really put down my vacation in Hawaii. I put down one day when I took the uh, 97 Island tour. <laughs> uh, but I did get a little, I got a note from the Chamber of Commerce. Did you really? Yeah, they've sent a, an aerial map to Tokyo. It's going to be <laughs> delivered on December 7th <laughs> of my house. Uh, no, they, they had a little blurb in the, in the paper about it, but I'm going back to Hawaii and uh, swim with the dolphins. And yeah. dolphins. You do good accents when you were doing the, the, the Indian thing. Did you always, did you, does that come easy to you, picking up dialects and accents? Well, it does when you are from India. <laughs> I was not really born on the Ponderosa. <laughs> did not know that. <laughs> All right, let me sell some. Then we're going to bring out, we have Carl Reiner with us tonight, Joanna Cassidy, and Miss Gloria Loring after this brief pause.